is Welcome to Morning at NTV this Thursday, the ninth day of June 2016. Glad to have your company, whether you're watching on air or online. This is Everyday Life and joining me is Nancy Kachungira. I am so excited to have her here on Everyday Life. It's, yes. it's an honor, it's a, it's a <laughs> blessing and it's, it's, it's great to have you here. You're, so, you're far too kind, Mabel. <laughs> Thank you. And for that introduction as well, I was wondering, who is she talking about? No, but Did you, they uh, bring another guest? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was actually doing research about you and there was so much. So anyway, let's get right into it <laughs> instead of wasting time. Brian asked, do you have any comments about our budget? Let's start from well, there. oh goodness, that would take all day. It really would. Um, I, I, I guess the most I would say is that we've got a long way to go. Um, I was at the World Economic Forum in Rwanda when I, where I moderated a few sessions. And I think the key here is really that we have to think that we can't afford to take the same approach that other countries have towards industrialization, towards development, because if we do that, the, num the amount of time it's going to take us to get anywhere, everyone else will be so far away. We have to start thinking about leapfrogging, about innovating, about doing things in a different way. So I, I, it would have been nice to see a bit more innovative thinking in okay the that's what i'll say <laughs> for, for now for now um nancy some people may not know but you actually started your career on radio yes and you used to host a show with pablo yes a very <laughs> popular show at the time i was wondering he has also gone to fly the comedy flag you know for africa up there did you ever talk about dreams of making it big on uh, the international scene uh, first, I have to say, Pablo is an amazing person. I'm so happy for all the success he's had. He really is one of the nicest people I've ever met. But honestly, we didn't really talk about that. You know, we just came, did our job, enjoyed it, and uh, moved on. I, I can't really speak specifically for him, but for me at least, um, I, I never thought I would be doing what I'm doing today. No. Okay. So, as a journalist, I read somewhere, you said journalism chose you you did not choose journalism uh, explain that to us i guess you meet some people who from the onset know exactly what they're going to do and they know from the time they're two years old that you know <laughs> they want to be a journalist that wasn't the case for me i'd never ever thought about it um, as a career path for myself mostly because i didn't think i had what it took um, so i guess you could call it you know the classic um, underestimation um, you know, we, we have of ourselves sometimes, uh, as especially as women, and I'm growing out of that. But it really just wasn't something I'd ever thought of doing. And so that's why I say journalism chose me, because the opportunity presented itself, um, and I didn't necessarily look for it. Of course, I worked hard once I got it, but I, I really do feel like it chose me. And if it weren't for the things that happened that sort of brought me into it, I don't think I ever would have stepped out to do it on my own. Okay. What would you have been? Or what hmm. was your dream as a little girl? <laughs> as a little girl, I wanted to be a teacher. Really? I know. Like, who oh wants to goodness. be a teacher? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> well, I did. I wanted to be a teacher. I'd sit down and do roll call of imaginary <laughs> students and imaginary <laughs> names, and that was for me so much fun um, but that's what I wanted to be and I've been so many things uh, I my first degree was an art degree so I am a watercolor painter as well in my spare time I did ballet dance for a while um, uh, I was a graphic designer for a long time and that's what helped me set up my company so I did a lot of different things so I could have been any one of those I suppose okay you were a moderator for the first ever presidential debate. Now, first of all, did you actually think it was going to happen? <laughs> I did. I did. Um, I commend the organizers because they were determined that come rain, come shine, come two candidates, come eight, <laughs> um, the debate was going to happen. So I was pretty sure that it would. Okay. And how did you feel, really, when y you were asked to moderate at the very first uh, presidential debate? Um, my immediate thought was, this is a huge responsibility. And I think that's, that was the recurring thought, is really what a responsibility it was and what a privilege it was. But importantly, um, I tried not to think of myself because it's very easy when you get you know, such a big job to think, oh, I have to look good, but that's not the point. It's not about you. You're supposed to serve. You're supposed to uh, fulfill a certain obligation towards your audience. 
And so primarily that's what I was thinking about. Um, so I talked to as many people as I could because I felt that this was about being a voice for the people who wanted answers and not really bringing my own, um, you know, my own thoughts or my own opinions or look at me, I'm so great at this job. And so I think that was my overarching thought. And the funny thing about that is that you stop worrying about whether you're going to make a good impression and you're just more focused on, I need to do this job right. Yeah. Well, I think you did an amazing job. Thank you. So many people were watching. But it wasn't the first time that you had moderated, I should say, a high-profile event. Uh, you had actually been specifically requested to host uh, Barack Obama during his town hall when he was in South Africa. How did you prepare for that? Um, the same way I prepare for everything else, honestly. And um, I think one of the things that does help, especially with making sure that you're fair, neutral, and balanced, is treating every assignment with the same kind of importance. So I would prepare the same way for Barack Obama as I would for a hawker on the street that I'm going to interview. I know that sounds um, perhaps far-fetched, but, but it's true. And I think when you, when you train yourself, when you train your character to take every assignment as an important one and every story as an, import, an important one, it becomes a part of your DNA and a part of who you are. And then I think your work starts to speak for itself that way. So I prepared for that the same way I prepare for everything else, as much as I could no stone unturned and you know just go in it with an attitude that um, I'm going to deliver something of value for my audience. Well I guess that's why you've been winning all these awards. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about the Komla Dumo Award, much beloved African who actually was on air I think the week he died. Yes, so was. it was for some of us who had been watching, mm -hmm. we usually watch uh, TV, it was very shocking but you're the first ever winner how did you get to know? Did they call you up? Did they send you an email? <laughs> I was actually in bed and had a really <laughs> horrible day. <laughs> uh, the previous day was horrible. And I was in bed and I got a phone call. It was a strange number. So I thought, oh, I'll just pick it up. And so this woman says, hello, I'm calling from the BBC. And you won the award. So I was silent on the line for like 15 minutes. Okay, maybe not 15, but for a while. Because I, it took my brain some time to process what was happening. But it was, it was such a great moment. It really was. It was amazing. And you've gone on to say many times after that, you know, you really want to tell the African story the best way possible. But I, I, I wonder, you want to change the African narrative. Um, I think sometimes we Africans just fold our hands and are comfortable with handouts and don't really... You know, we don't want to see much change. Is that your opinion as well, or do you have a different opinion? Well, you see, that in itself is a narrative. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is what I want us to break out of. For instance, what is the European story? What is the Asian story? Why must Africa have an African story? Um, when you think about African print, you think of a very specific sort of thing. And yet, African print should be anything and everything. Um, European is, um, Asian is, to, to a certain extent. So I think the thing about narrative is that it's about ideology. And for any nation, any collective to be successful, it must have an ideology that underpins it. Americans think their country is the greatest nation in the world because, mm. you know, I mean, there's movies, there's even the passport will have, you know, um, quotes on different pages reinforcing that image that America is the greatest nation in the world. Students will pledge allegiance to the flag when they're in, in school every morning. But what does it mean for us to be African? What do we know about being African besides the poverty, the war, the disease that, you know, that we see all the time? Or Trevor Noah comparing Trump to an African <laughs> president because apparently that's our brand. And so I think what needs to change is this concept of Africa that is based on a view from outside because people are always looking at us and telling us what we are but we need to define who we are as Africans. A very quick example, the concept of African time that's gotten a really bad rap. Everywhere you go someone will say, oh African time, they're late. But what if we took that back and said actually African time is not a bad thing because where we're coming from we had time to say, when we called someone and said I'm coming to your house I could come anytime between 2 and 5 p.m., okay? So I'm not going to say I'll be there exactly at 3. And maybe that came out of a situation where we didn't know if we are going to have to cross the river that was flooded <laughs> or stop by a neighbor's <laughs> house. But the point is, perhaps that's a good thing because we have time for people. We have time to 
to be going somewhere but stop on the road and say, do you need help? Do you need directions? We have time to spend in community and taking care of other people's needs. And maybe it's not such a bad thing to have flexible time for that purpose, that you can actually stop and pause and enjoy life. So if we chose to redefine concepts that have been labeled as negative, whether it's our own culture, whether it's our own traditions, or just who we are, the color of our skin, I think we'd get a lot further in terms of those narratives. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk about the entrepreneur you are. Digital media mm -hmm. is your specialty. Why that one? Well, it seemed a natural fit. Uh, I had a history in graphic design. That's what I studied for my first degree. I worked as a graphic designer for a number of agencies. And my sister is an amazing marketer. She can sell ice to an Eskimo. <laughs> so sand to an Arab. Sand to an Arab. <laughs> she can sell ice on the internet. Um, and so it seemed like a natural fit um, that we would come together and do something in the space that we were, I guess, best place to do. And we always knew that we wanted to start our own business at some point. So it was, I guess, a perfect storm. Okay. And the awards that you do, that you have on an annual basis, is that part of your CSR? Well, what's the story behind those awards? Uh, the story behind the social media awards is really to grow the industry. Because we realize that if this is the industry that we're working in, we need a certain level of, I guess you could say, growth, um, even for us to be sustained. So we really just wanted to recognize the people in the space who were making a difference, who were being innovative and creative and doing great things. And by doing so, hope that the industry would grow and that we would grow with it. Nancy, you've had a long uh, journey. You've achieved so much in such a short time. Um, I'm just wondering, what lessons have you learned that you can share with us? So many, <laughs> uh, but to sum it up, I would say perhaps the two most important things I've learned from business, from being in the media is know others and know yourself. Uh, when I say know others, in business I think that's probably the most important thing I've learned. Sometimes you go to a meeting and you're thinking, I need to make this pitch and I need to do a great job of this pitch so that I can get the business. Yet what sh you should be thinking is, what are the pain points that this customer has? How can I solve problems for them? Because that way you'll be more effective in your pitch because it directly addresses their need. Same with employees. When you think, what motivates them? What do they need? For some it is money, for others it's not. Maybe it's a pat on the back, maybe it's recognition. So when you know others, when you study the behavior of others, you, you will find it much easier in business because business is about relationships. Okay. Yeah. And to those who are watching and really want to make it big on the media scene, <laughs> what word would you have for them? Not just in Uganda, but across Africa. Because recently you received an, uh, another award, International yes. African Woman of the Year. Yes, um, which was also great. That was in recognition of uh, my TED Talks and articles that I'd done on the African narrative. But I would say have a goal that is bigger than making it in media. Because when your goal is to change an African narrative, when it's to help voiceless people tell stories, then I think the making it is a byproduct, and that's the way it should be. But the goal should not be to have glory, it should be to do something great. And I think that's the, that's the way I'd put it. And obviously you couldn't have said it any better. Uh, have a goal that is bigger than yourself. Thank you very much, Nancy. And Nancy is still with us here. Today is, <laughs> Brian is very happy. Uh, today we have some guests from uh, the Serena Hotel. They'll be telling us about Haiti. You may have wondered about this uh, setup that we have behind here. I'll invite the ladies to come and join us here as well as Brian Mulondo. I think you had a question for Madame Kachungira. And uh, yeah, this is the opportunity. So, yes, Brian. Um, okay, I'm not the owner of this. <laughs> Okay, we'll have these people from the Serena. The, yeah, the ladies of the Serena, I think, are making their way here to tell us about the high tea that will be happening at the hotel this weekend. Can, can, can I use, can I tap your mic? Yes, okay. I will come nearer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, nice. I, I, think, I think for me it's, it's about women and, and what you think the conversation should be about women. We've had a huge conversation about feminists and whether we get it wrong. Mabel was uh, attacked a few weeks ago on social oh, really? media for, for thinking differently from what the, the mainstream woman thinks about who they are and whether they deserve what they are going through. But for you, what is your position about women? Huh. 
What's my position about women? Um, I think it's my position on human beings, really, is that we deserve fair treatment. We deserve equal treatment. And I guess the challenge is that for women, nobody's going to give it to us. Mm. We have to take it. Mm. And I think when we realize that we have that power and agency within ourselves, then those barriers will start. They have no choice. They will start to come down. It's just like when people say that, oh, Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves or, you know. Yeah. No, the slaves fought for their freedom. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they won it. You know, nobody gave it to them. Mm -hmm. They exerted enough pressure that they got what they wanted. And I think as women, that, that's what we need to do. Okay, I'm being told we have to take a short break, uh, but Morning at NTV will return. Don't go anywhere.